Hello, Lemonsterites. It is your June episode of Representing Lemonster. I am your state representative, Natalie Higgins. I am still in my home office, and I am really, really thrilled to be joined uh, with a good friend of mine, Representative Paul Mark from the 2nd Berkshire District. Uh, and, and for those of you who aren't aware, uh, Rep Mark is actually from Peru. When I met Rep Mark, that was the first time I found out that there was a town in Massachusetts <laughs> named Peru. Uh, so really excited to have him uh, on in this episode to talk about the census. It's something that if you follow me on social media, I've been plugging a lot. It's really important for a variety of reasons. And I'm excited to have Rep Mark on with me to talk about why it's so important that we complete our census every 10 years. Rep well, Mark, thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you, Representative, for having me on. Uh, usually when I say to people uh, I'm from Peru or someone mentions I'm from Peru to people in eastern Massachusetts, they, they literally don't know that that's a town. And so I always have to say, that's a town in the Berkshires. Uh, it's, a, it's a small town. It's a town of about 850 people. And I, I believe I'm the only legislator in the state who actually lives in a community of less than not just 1,000 people, but of less than uh, 4,000 people. If if uh, if the last really, number. yeah, I, I don't think anybody else. I I think uh, Smitty Pignatelli and Natalie Blair are, are close, but their towns have like 5,000 people in them. So okay. I, I, yeah, yeah. So they, that those are metropolises to <laughs> to where I live. And, I know. We're a, a huge 42,000 here in Lemonster. <laughs> oh, I know. It's it's uh it's a great city. I, I've actually been lucky to be there a couple of times. Johnny Appleseed, right? Yeah, yeah. Claim claim to fame. <laughs> Nice. Honey Appleseed, Pink Lawn Flamingos, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, so. but, but being in the town of Peru, I should mention, for people that are watching, uh, there's a reason I'm not on video. And, and the reason mm. is Peru, Peru is one of those towns out in Western Massachusetts that we don't have access to high-speed internet. And I don't, my cell phone service doesn't work at my house. So to use uh, internet like this, I have to go drive somewhere and find a place uh, where I have sufficient cell phone service and use this thing on my phone. So I just, I, the video like overloads it, <laughs> which, which is a blessing for all of you. You just don't realize it, <laughs> but thanks for having me on uh, regardless. I hope, hopefully this will be helpful and interesting to people in Lemonster. Yeah. I'm so excited to have you on. And I think that this is the really cool thing about being in the Massachusetts legislature. We're a small state, but there is pretty significant diversity. And I really appreciate you stepping up on a lot of the rural issues that we share a little bit in, in Central Mass. We know some of these issues, but I, I think folks forget about the internet connectivity. It's not just about people being able to afford it. It's about people actually having access to it in a lot of parts of the state. Yeah, exactly. And in, even out your way, I think in Westminster and Winchenden are, are pretty close to, to Lemonster. Yeah, they, yeah. they have very similar issues. And I think they were further along than we were. And I'm, I'm hopeful, I don't know exactly, I'm hopeful that maybe their problem is either solved or close to being solved. If every every city in town, and there was 123 of them out of 351 that had this internet problem, have at least a plan now, if not uh, a final implementation. And so where, where I live, uh, the internet should be done this year. A couple of my towns, I, I represent 16 different communities, I should mention as well. Mm. Uh, Peru and 12 other really small towns. And then I have the city of Greenfield, the entire city, part of the city of, of Pittsfield, and then the town of Dalton has like 7,000 people. So again, that's, that's, that's big to us. And then there's 13 like really small towns. So just, just uh, in, in terms of geographic diversity and even urban, suburban, and extremely rural, there is a lot of diversity within within my district itself. Uh, it's, it's almost like there's regions within the, this, the district. So until Absolutely. this crisis started, we, we, would, we would do like 60,000 miles a year in the car driving around the district and driving into Boston and everything, so. Right, because for me, it takes me about 15 minutes to get from one end of my district to the other in a car. For you, I can't imagine how long that takes hour and a half. <laughs> An hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. And so for folks, right, who aren't super familiar with the size of the rep district, so there's 160 state representatives. We represent about 42,000 people um, per last, last census numbers. Um, and I'm one of the lucky seven that <laughs> get to represent one city in its entirety or one small community in its entirety. Most others have a number of cities and towns. Even, even Representative Stephen Hay in Pittsburgh has has Fitchburg been part of Lunenburg? Because Fitchburg isn't quite large enough to be a full rep district. Right. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And, and, and so part of the reason why I'm so interested in the census is because I, I chair the Committee on Redistricting. And so once the census is done this year and the numbers are transmitted to us next year, we will undertake the redistricting process. And yeah, you, you and uh, six of, your of our colleagues 
you have the easiest from your end, the easiest uh, time of it, and you make my job the easiest because your district <laughs> really can't change. Uh, assuming right. that the numbers stay exactly where they are in the range where you get to be self-contained. But yeah, in, in, in places like mine, and even as the chair of co the committee, I mean, I can't do myself special favors. I have to go by mm -hmm. math. So my district changed 40% in the last redistricting process when I was a, a first term rep. And I imagine, you know, again, even as chair, because of the decline in population out my way, it's going to change. Sure. And, and there's just no way around it. That, that's how it works. And so can you tell us a little bit about, I know the census in 2020, usually getting the census done is difficult, throwing in a global pandemic where many of us are, are, are sheltering in our homes and, and staying home as much as, as, as possible. How has that impacted the census and the timeline and like kind of what changes have been put into place to, to accommodate kind of the, the tougher task ahead of us? Yeah, it, it's, it's significantly changed the process. So just as some background, uh, since for about 80 years ago, the official census reporting date has been designated as April 1st. And so what that means is the census, census obviously is, is a count of every person in the country, and that has been specified in the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3. And so every 10 years since 1790, we've conducted a census, you know, back when there was only 13 states all the way to the mm -hmm. present. And so April 1st is designated as that's the day the census counts. So that's where you are on April 1st is supposed to be where you count. Uh, it, it, if you were alive, I know this is morbid, but we're talking about a pandemic. If you were alive on April 1st, you count. If you were not alive after that, then you don't count. Similarly, uh, in, in, in the cheerful section, if you were born before April yeah. 1st, yeah, you count. If you were born tomorrow, then you're not supposed to count in the 2020 census, that kind of thing. And so anticipating April 1st as the census day, April 1st of 2019, over a year ago, we started having uh, kickoffs and events mm -hmm. all over the state. And, and, and Secretary Galvin, I should mention, Secretary of State for Massachusetts, he's the official liaison for Massachusetts for the census. And he hosted a big event down in Framingham. They appointed mm -hmm. a, a statewide complete count committee. And so after, after that event happened, uh, the Committee on Redistricting, we worked with, you know, any, any local rep uh, that was interested, you know, all the way to, to today, obviously, uh, having an event like this on online, uh, but we would, we, would, we would go in person when it was safe to go in person, and then we've had events online since the pandemic. And, and we got ready, and everything was supposed to start in March, and then all of a sudden the world changed. And mm -hmm. so the field operations for the census, they began with mailings. And so at this point, I read just the other day, 96% of the contacts have been made now, the initial contact, which means for people in Lemonster, it's, it's, it, you probably got your mailing in March. It's an invitation right. to fill out the census. You have a unique code on it. In some places that were in the fourth wave of the mailings, they didn't get them right away. And so they, they, they should have received them right now. In places like Western Massachusetts, where it's a little more rural, some, some homes actually don't have mail delivery at their home, believe it or not. And so if you have to go to, like there's towns that the entire town has to go to a P.O. box or mm -hmm. if you have rural delivery where you, you go to a box down the street, that kind of thing. Right. You, had to, you had to wait for someone to actually physically bring the census form, the census invitation to your house. And so at this point, most people in Massachusetts should have received all of that. The entire operation was supposed to be completed by the end of July. But because of everything that has happened, you now have until October 31st of this year to fill it out. And, and so obviously before the pandemic began and then during the pandemic, it took on more urgency. The preferred method of filling out the census is to self-respond. And so if you got this invitation, you can go online and you can fill out your census there. That's the easiest, fastest way to do it. You can call in. There's telephone numbers and there's telephone numbers that make the census available in English and 12 additional foreign languages. And it's one of those things where you call in, you don't go through a menu to get to French. It, it's just, you call the lump number in French and they answer in French, for example. And then finally, you can, you can mail in your census as well. If people don't do any of that, if they don't take advantage of self-responding, then what happens is the door-to-door -door people, the enumerators come and those operations were supposed to be happening right now and they have been delayed. They're going to start in the near future, either the end of June or sometime in July. But again, now the new deadline is Halloween, the end of October. So there's a bigger timetable to work with. And there's some things that have changed, like if you wanna talk about 
counting college students, counting the homeless, that kind of thing. There, there's new timelines for that, but again, it, 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 it needs to happen still pretty quickly under the new guidelines as well. And so I know in our community, in Lemonster, there was some confusion because the city does their yearly census and then the 10 year annual census came, came shortly after that. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of folks, I got a lot of calls saying, I already did it. <laughs> and it said, but I keep getting these notices and, and we had to really make sure that they did the federal census. And to remember, there are also a number of folks who were concerned that it was a lot of questions and they didn't have time for it. And it's really comprehensive. And then that's not this census, right? That the, the organization that puts out the census also puts out a number of other community survey, surveys, but the census is 10 questions. It takes less than 10 minutes. It is actually quite, quite easy to do. Um, and, and really important because so many things beyond just what the districts look like, but, but a lot of the federal uh, resources that we get are right. dependent on who is in our community and what the need is there. Yeah, no, it's exactly right. So the, the U.S. Census is completely different from your local town survey. I mean, obviously, if you can, you should fill, fill that mm -hmm. out as well. But yeah, this, this is something that, again, has been required under the Constitution since 1790, so for over 200 years. And the U.S. Census is the building block for, yes, first, our, our political representation. So this affects our members of the State House, our members of the State Senate, our members to the Governor's Council, and also our members to the U.S. House of Representatives. And so when we look at uh, the population back in 2010, the way the census went, and then the redistricting that happened after, Massachusetts, the population grew, but it didn't grow quickly enough. And so if you remember, we, we actually lost a member of Congress. And John Olver, I know he came as far as uh, Fitchburg. I don't know if he went to Lemonster, but he but he he went from the Berkshires out, out east, and so uh, that district was actually completely eliminated and had to be absorbed. And so that affects obviously our voice in Washington, mm -hmm. but it also affects the electoral college, you know, which which is how we vote for the president. And then equally important, uh, different. It's taken on more importance in in recent decades, and I think it's going to continue to take more importance. Is yes, the census is the basis for over six hundred and seventy five billion dollars in federal aid. And it is the basis for hundreds of state and federal programs. And so the estimate is under normal circumstances, the person, average person, if you do not fill out your census, you cost your community $2,300 a year for the next 10 years, because these numbers are the numbers we are stuck with now until 2030. And when you think about the pandemic, you mm -hmm. think about the recovery from the pandemic, the stimulus money we've seen already, the stimulus money that we hope is yet to come, those, those dollars, in theory, next year, starting next year, are going to be allocated by these census numbers. And so to me, the $2,300 per person is only going to get higher and, and, and more important. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that that's helpful for folks to understand um, just how directly it impacts our community. Um, can you talk a little bit about, I know some folks are worried about their privacy when they're yeah. filling out the census and who this information is shared with and how it's shared. Can you talk a little bit about the protections that have been in place? all yeah. of this time to, to make sure that that data is secure. Yeah, under, under federal law, the census is secure. The people that work for the Census Bureau are required to swear an oath that says that they will protect this data, not just for the time they worked there, but for the rest of their lives. Violation of that oath is subject to significant financial penalties, like in the hundreds of thousands of dollars and jail time, like I think up to five years in jail. Mm -hmm. They take it very Seriously, the data is protected. The individual data is protected for 72 years. So nothing that identifies an individual person, an indi individual family can be released by the Census Bureau for 72 years from now. So, you know, like now you can go on Ancestry.com or something and you can find mm -hmm. old documents, yeah, from like 1910, but that's because enough time has passed. Sure. Obviously, the census data can be used for statistical purposes in the aggregate. So like Lemonster has 43,000 people, that, that kind of thing can be mm -hmm. shared. But the federal census cannot share information with law enforcement or any other agency other than those pure numbers. And like you were saying earlier, the census itself is only 10 questions and it's pretty, pretty basic questions. They fill out now what they call the American Community Survey. The Census Bureau exists for the entire 10 years, so in, in between the, the federal censuses, and they try to find out more statistical, more detailed information during that time. And, you know, those, those responses are more voluntary if you want to be engaged, but you know, this, this is basic building blocks. 
how many people are in the community, where do you live most of the year, that kind of thing. And it affects a lot of, of different programs. Great. So one thing to, to remind folks, because I'm looking at the Massachusetts numbers and the Lemonster numbers right now, mm -hmm. Massachusetts self-response rate is 63.5%. Lemonster self-response rate is a little bit better at 67.9%. Mm -hmm. But even when you go down into the census tracts, there's a really cool tool that shows just how different um, the response rate is in different parts of Lemonster. I'm actually going to share my screen and I'll talk through it some, uh, so that you can understand. Um, but even though we have, in, in general, um, a pretty good response rate, we have communities in, or pockets of Lemonster that have really low response rates at 53%. Um, and then other neighborhoods that are really high at 79%. So it's really important that we are, are getting everyone in our community to respond. And if you don't want someone showing up to your front door, you can go online or you can call in and you don't have to worry about that. So you can do this and you can compare us um, to, to other communities. We always like to compare ourselves to Fitchburg. We're doing, we're doing okay. We're doing a little bit stronger than Fitchburg. So Lemonster is holding its own, but we can do better, right? We're not still at the rate that we were 10 years ago. And we've got to beat that. The more accurate our data can be, the better it is for our community and making sure that we get those vital services. Right. And, and talking about uh, safety, thinking about the pandemic, if people, if you don't want a census worker coming to your house, then the best thing possible to do is, is to self-respond. And yes, the people, when they go out, they're going to have masks, they're going to have proper mm -hmm. equipment, they're going to do it in a sanitary fashion. But, you know, I, I filled mine out as, as quickly as I could because, you know, who, and that was before, um, before we got really deep into the state of emergency because I would prefer not to deal with someone coming to my door. But that's why I live in the hills. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. Is there anything else? So when we do representing Lemonster and we get to have elected officials on our show, one of the things we like to ask um, is kind of how did you decide to run for office to share your story with our, our viewers and also any tips you have on, on how to be a better advocate, um, no matter what issue you care about, right? We can learn from each other and how uh, to do a better job at, at advocating to, to our elected leaders at any level. Well, so for me, the, the long story, you know, it's a long story because it starts off when I, I was eight years old, <laughs> Governor Dukakis was running for president mm -hmm. and uh, he was marching on the 4th of July parade. And for whatever reason, he came over and he shook my hand and I was like really excited by that. And I thought, wow, this guy's going to be the president. And I started watching uh, the politics and the news and then, you know, he lost and I was devastated. And mm -hmm. I, I, I started learning more about politics when I was like 16. I started volunteering on campaigns uh, and, and. By the time I was uh, 20, I worked full time at uh, the phone company. Back then it was Bell Atlantic, now it's Verizon. And I got involved in the union and we used to get involved in politics and do a lot of different things. And so I, I had worked on campaigns for state rep all the way up to president of the United States. I'd gone to town meeting and in my town, there's, there's, there's actual town meeting. You go in and you, every single person in the town has the right to talk and, and vote on things individually, which is pretty cool. And I still never thought I'd run. And I went to law school, dumb thing to do, right? <laughs> and, uh, that debt I have. Oh, yeah, it's rough. And uh, at, at, at some point, the representative who served before me, who was, you know, good, good rep, good guy, he, uh, he announced he was retiring. And people started saying to me, well, Paul, you know, you know so much. You get involved in these campaigns all the time. You tell us how to vote. Why don't you run? Why don't you put your money where your mouth is? And I, I thought about it for like a week or two. And things just really lined up. And I, I never thought I'd be the one who actually ran. And, you know, you pull the trigger. And then <laughs> to, my, to my great dismay, uh, it went really well and I won. <laughs> so, you know, you get, you get, uh, you get more involved. But it, it, as a student of the law, and I'm, I'm being silly, but, you know, it's actually, it's actually a really interesting job. And, it, and it's a really interesting place to, to work. And you meet so many people, both great colleagues like yourself, who have interesting backgrounds. And I, I was lucky I knew you before you ran. Right your work on the higher ed uh, student debt and everything and um, you know you, you meet interesting people around the district especially in, in my district there's towns I had been to but like you know there, there was towns I, I really just wasn't familiar with mm -hmm. and, and, and you get to know these people so much better and, and, and so for people that just want to be involved I would say because I because I've been involved in so many different ways yeah. you know do, do what you think is interesting to you don't set yourself a goal that you can't meet. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of people out there that, 
think they should be the president of the United States and, you know, don't, don't set that as a, a goal. I, I've heard Congressman Neal say, you're more likely to end up as a major league baseball player than you are to end up as a member of the U S Congress. So, you know, don't, don't have that as your fallback. Maybe, maybe do something else on the side, but you know, it, it's, 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 if you like campaign, the campaign a- aspect, you know, volunteer for candidates you believe in. So, you know, like Representative Higgins, if you think she's doing a good job, get out there and, and, and volunteer when she has a campaign or people running for mayor, whatever it might be. If issues are more what you care about, get involved in, in advocacy, you know, building a relationship with your local legislator, with your mayor, with your city council. To me, people always ask me, like, what's the most effective thing I can do? What's the most effective uh-huh. advocacy? And, and it's like, you know, everything, everything matters. An email matters, a phone call matters. Right. Um, But what matters the most to me is people I've gotten to know. And it's almost people in the district become go-to people for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, become an expert on a subject matter that maybe I didn't know that much about. So there's so many ways. Do do what fits in your comfort level. But yeah, if you care about something, definitely, definitely get involved. Don't sit back and let other people make the decisions for you. Yeah, I'm always encouraging folks to, to share their stories, right, and, and share their expertise, because as a state rep, you're kind of jack of all trades, master of very few, yeah. uh, right? Like, yeah. I, I have had the privilege of doing a lot of work on higher education, and that's how you and I got to know each other before I came to the legislature. Yeah. Um, but I can't know every single issue, and I rely on so many of my constituents to, to reach out to me, to share their stories, to share their ideas, uh, because they help me understand an issue better. And I think that that's one of the great things about being in the Massachusetts legislature, right? To pass legislation, we have to have 200 voices yeah. crafting yeah. that bill. And it can be painfully slow for a lot of folks, but it makes a better piece of legislation because we make sure that there aren't those unintended consequences that we might not miss with just a few brains, right? We need all of those different perspectives from the different districts with the different constituencies really speaking to them. Yeah, no, and it's a great point what you just said. The Constitution of Massachusetts has been in existence since 1780, and the lawmaking process moves at a 1780 pace, which is extremely frustrating in 2020. But at the same time, what you said is so important. It's like we're, we're making the law. We aren't, you know, microwaving a, a, a pasta dish here. This is something that it needs to be thought out. It needs to be deliberated. It needs to have hearings. It needs to have public input. Because, yeah, once a law is in place, it is very difficult to undo it. And so you want to make sure, like you said, the the unintended consequences, you know, never something that we're not expecting. Something that seems like such a good idea can have a number of of, um, circumstances that follow. And, and, And when you think about Massachusetts, yes, it's a small state. It's mostly urbanized. But at the same time, something that works in Boston might not work in Lemonster, might not work in the Berkshires. Absolutely. You know, and you, and you have to be respectful of that. It, it, it's so important. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, the time has sure flown. Uh, and I'm so glad that people got to learn about the second Berkshire district a little bit. Uh, as we're wrapping up, is there anything else about the census, um, about this project and, and anything that people can do before October 31st to make sure that Massachusetts has a good showing um, in completing the census? If, if you're watching this and you know friends or family that haven't filled it out, you know, if you, if you could just suggest to them that they do it is great. If you have an opportunity to go online and maybe see the census website or see the self-response rate that you just put up and maybe throw it on your Facebook, throw it on your Twitter so that your networks understand, that's also very, very appreciated and encouraged. And then if you're part of a community organization, you know, and you can get your community organization to do, uh, you know, put in your newsletter or put it on your website, whatever it is, you know, every little bit adds up. And I mean, we don't want to lose a member of Congress. We shouldn't. The way the way the population was expected to grow before the pandemic started, you know, we were looking really good on, on, on keeping a member of Congress. Mm-hmm. But now, you know, there's some concern with, especially with students being counted, um, that things could be in jeopardy and we don't want to, we don't want to do that. So, so, you know, make sure everyone you know is getting counted. Talk about why it's, it's, it's important. Talk about why you know it's safe, what you've learned. And if you have questions, please, as a committee chair, obviously I prefer they go through your office to me, but I, I, I am welcome to listen to uh, any commentary people have on the census or redistricting uh, at any time. And, and, and representative, please feel free to send people along or, or uh, send questions my way. Absolutely. And for folks who want to get involved at the local level, um, social media definitely is something that we've turned to, to to get the word out and local press. 
um, but our city clerk, Caitlin Huffman, is chairing the complete count committee for the city of Lemonster, uh, of which I'm a part of, and, and, and a number of community members uh, and community leaders are a part of. So please get involved. If you have ideas, we want to hear them. Uh, we are stronger working together. So thank you for tuning into my June episode. I look forward to seeing you in July. I look forward to seeing you one day soon in person. Um, I hope you're all healthy and well. And if you need me in the meantime, you know how to get a hold of me. You can call our district office at 978-227-5278, or you can shoot me an email, natalie.higgins at mahouse.gov. Take care, everybody.